Hello everybody, uh, Joe Ciccarelli here. We're at the beautiful, wonderful La Fabrique Studios in the south of France. We just finished a week at Mix with the Masters. Fantastic, just magical week with 13 participants that, that uh, shared their ideas and it's quite, quite a fun week. And we had the beautiful and talented Rachel Yamagata here singing and recording a track with us and quite inspiring for everybody. Uh, we have some questions from, from the, the sports fans and the gear addicts. Um, and the first question from Daniel Alba. Uh, Daniel is asking about basically how to get started in the business and what the best way for a young engineer is, whether he should take the traditional approach, which is working at a major studio and kind of working his way up the ladder from gopher to assistant engineer to first engineer, or if he should go to a recording school and take the approach of working in his own private studio, cultivating a client base, and maybe coming up with his own unique way of recording. Uh, I think honestly, both approaches work. The traditional one, unfortunately, there's less and less opportunities. Uh, it, there's less and less commercial studios, sadly, less opportunities. You're going to have to do a lot of dirty work, a lot of cleaning floors and coiling microphone cables like I did. And, uh, but the positive thing is you can be around other engineers and producers and learn from them. And that's one of the really amazing pluses is seeing different other different people work, their workflows, their style, their, their sounds, their conceptualization. That's really important. That's how I learned and, and, and that was really wonderful for me. Now you can start your own studio, build your client base and learn in your own unique way. That's cool too. You may end up uh, Carving a very unique and specialized niche for yourself could be really good. And then later you can always go and work with other producers and learn from other producers and engineers their style. In fact, that, that might even be a good way to do it because you'll have developed a lot of the basic techniques, things that you didn't learn in school, and then you'll be able to really understand other producers and engineers, their workflow, their their thought processes. So perhaps that way can work too. So it's really what's best for you. It's a life decision more it is a career decision. Okay, next question is from Chitu Alexandru. And he's asking about vocals in a mix and how do you make them sit well in the mix and glue to the track? Good question. Uh, and he's talking about pretty much in the box techniques, but honestly, what I do in the box, I would do outside the box. And first of all, it tends to be parallel compression. Um, sometimes I might put a bit of a compressor on the insert of the vocal just to give it a tone, keep the peaks under control. I might do more of my compression in the parallel compression. I blend that in with the normal lead vocal track. I add 20, 30 percent, just depends. Often I'll use multiple parallel compressors. Uh, perhaps I'll mix and match things. One compressor because it has a certain sound, I'll use that in the verse. Another compressor that perhaps has a bigger or more aggressive sound, I might use that in the chorus. Could even use a third one for the bridge, just depends on the song. But I will um, definitely apply some sort of effects, even when the vocal wants to remain a bit dry. Uh, I'll, I'll maybe put some dark delays back there behind it. That if, if you do rhythmic delays with lead vocal and you get them so they're not heard as delays, they tend to help the vocal glue to the track. They make it bounce a little bit more. They give it a little bit more life and rhythm and help help it sit above all the other instruments and tracks. So, so I'll 
very subtly do that kind of stuff. And it really depends on the music, how much it's heard, how bright or how dark those delays are. Perhaps the vocal might need a little bit of extension, a little bit more depth. I might do some type of dark plate or hall, whatever's appropriate for the music. Um, and that really, the, the, I have to say, the music really determines everything. I think you're mostly asking about pop. So with pop, the delays can be brighter, the reverbs, uh, any chorusing effect you might use. Sometimes even a little bit of flanging helps uh, get the vocal to, to be a little bit more exciting. Um, and they can be brighter in pop music than they can be perhaps in rock or even rap music for that matter. Hope that answers your question. Mao is asking uh, what effects in popular music have surprised me lately when I listen to the radio. Uh, I think the one thing that's, that's pretty funny to me is how it's cool again to use reverb, whether it's natural or artificial. Uh, having grown up in the 90s and made records in the 90s, it was not cool to use reverb. Those were dry times. You were, you were fired as an engineer if you tried to sneak some reverb in a rock band's mix. Um, dry was in, even in, in bigger pop records that you'll go back in time and they're definitely drier in the 90s. So now everybody's using reverb and it's cool and it's okay. And um, you'll hear big giant reverberant records on Grizzly Bear and even, even Adele for that matter isn't afraid of using reverb. So it, it, it's kind of funny to me how trends of effects happen and they come and go and you know years ago in the the 80s everything was very processed and lots of delays and and unfortunately when you hear that music now it sounds very dated so i don't know let's see in 10 years if if things sound like 2013 we'll find out okay next question ricky terra ferrera asks what are your methods of layering different vocals in a track? Uh, that's a good question. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'm assuming, Ricky, that you're talking about actually recording them. And if that's the case, uh, I'll tell you one or two things that I often do. Uh, perhaps if I'm doing a lead vocal, then doubling it. Often I'll do the double on a different microphone. Uh, perhaps I'll look for sound for the double that will complement the lead vocal. In other words, if the lead vocal is very bright, I might look for the double to be very dull. And I'll do the same with background vocals. Perhaps if I'm doing uh, stereo background vocals, I might do one where the singer is very close on the mic and one when they're further away. Especially if I'm doing, uh, especially if I'm doing gang vocals where you might do three, four passes of group background vocals. I'll always make sure that they are each at different positions in the room. I'll switch the singers around, move them further back off the mics. Anything to get a little bit more depth and bigness in the sound so it's not the exact same vocal sound on top of the exact same vocal sound. I make sure that each track, even if it's via compression or equalization or microphone placement, I make sure everything's just a little different because I think they add up to a much bigger sound that way. Hope that helps. Question from Andrew Pettit. Uh, Andrew asks, mixing in analog or mixing in the box or hybrid mixing, I'm assuming he means via summing and some console, uh, which do you prefer and why? Well, I grew up with analog tape and mixing on analog consoles, so that's the most familiar to me. I'm the most fluid at it. Uh, it's sort of part of my being, so that would probably be the easiest and most favorite way for me. However, there are obvious advantages of mixing in the box, primarily recall. Uh, these days, record companies want multiple different versions of songs for 
A&R approval, manager approval, European market versus Asian market. So having the ability to quickly recall mixes is a fantastic thing. Um, hybrid mixing, meaning I'm sure he means via summing boxes, uh, where you do a lot of mixing in Pro Tools and then sum through the desk is great. I think it's a great way to get the advantages of in-the-box mixing, but to get the quality of an analog console. So given a lot of the needs of things these days, hybrid mixing can be the best way to go. Um, the good thing about analog mixing is that usually every time you recall it, it's a little bit different. So it's almost like a painter. He's never going to paint the same mix twice. So sometimes you come up with things that you actually beat the original and are, are indeed better. Uh, where sometimes when you're in the box, I find that you just repeat yourself. Maybe you turn that guitar up a little bit, but ultimately it's, it's the same mix. So they both have their advantages. Hope that answers it, Andrew. Okay, Andrew Gentili asks a, a very tricky question here. He asks what my position is on mixing loud. And do I find myself mixing louder than I was in the past, perhaps? And he also asks an interesting question about mastering, if it's really, really necessary these days in the fact that we're not necessarily always doing vinyl or CD and we're delivering files direct to iTunes or whomever. Um, so he's asking if mastering is necessary. My, my feeling on, on deliberately mixing loud and pushing digital levels and trying to outdo somebody else on the radio, to me, it's, it's not my favorite way of working. It's not something I believe in. I think you make the best, most musical record possible. You don't worry about loudness because every single radio station is going to sound different. And sometimes if you try deliberately to push the level, when it finally gets out there on the radio, the radio compressors can be pretty evil boxes. And usually the loudest thing tends to get compressed even more. So if you're compressing your mixes hard to make them sound loud, chances are they're going to start to sound smaller compared to things that are more honest and organic. And I also feel it's your, your job, it's your duty to the artist to make a record that will stand the test of time. And even though over the past few years mixing loud was a trend, I think that artist might not want to listen to that record in five years or ten years' time. So I would hate to do anything that would compromise the artist's long-term career. So I would prefer to make a great sounding record and then worry about the levels when it comes to the radio. I think mastering is really, really necessary because everybody needs an objective ear. A band hires a producer because they want a, an objective ear. A producer needs an A&R man because he needs an objective ear. And I think the mastering engineer is the engineer or the mixer's objective ear. And sometimes it's what he doesn't do to it, and sometimes it's the things he adds to it. So I trust my mastering engineers. I give them a lot of freedom. I, I hope that they will look at my work and find the one little thing that I missed that they can add to it that'll help make it a well-rounded musical mix. So I'm always in favor of using trusted and great mastering engineers. I think it's something that no artist should ever skimp on. Okay, Joel Davis's question is, what was my approach when working with Jason Mraz on the song, The Woman I Love? Um, interesting question. Jason wanted to do something where uh, we showcased great musicians, great arrangers, great recording, and, and were really sensitive to the song. And we all listened and loved to those, we all listened and loved those classic albums that were done in Muscle Shoals with Paul Simon and Aretha Franklin and Dire Straits. 
where the, the musicians were really a part of the record and you, you heard virtuosity and you heard tasteful playing and it wasn't about layering lots of tracks, it was really about honest organic parts and the chemistry of the, the musicians in the room. So with that particular song, I, I can say I think we were very much thinking of a, uh, a 70s Muscle Shoals, almost blue-eyed soul uh, version of the song. And I, I think if there was a theme for the album, it might be to incorporate those real honest elements of great songwriting, great singing, and great musicianship, and not a lot of trickery. So we have a question here from Daniel Bruns. Uh, a little tricky question, and uh, I might surprise him with my answer here. Um, he asks, when I sit down to mix a song, rock or alternative, what instrument do I start with? And then he also asks, what are some of my go-to gear or starting points from the mix? Um, the tricky point is I, I don't start with one instrument. I start with everything. I put the whole mix in, I get myself a great rough balance before I do any compression or EQ or anything. I, I put every single fader up, make it sound like a song, and then I'll sit back, take a listen, and go, okay, perhaps the drums need a little adjustment, the bass needs to be more powerful, drums need a little bit more sparkle, a little bit more snap, uh, the vocal needs some effects to glue it to the track. And then I might break the mix down a little bit, but I'm not going to use a solo button. I'm going to maybe take the vocal out and start to work on the drums with everything else in there. Uh, the way I look at a mix is it's a, it's a house, and you build it and build it and build it, but you don't necessarily start with the second floor and expect the third floor is going to work with the foundation. So I, I like to kind of start with it all together and put the pieces together like a painting. And um, I very rarely will I solo an instrument. Maybe if I'm having problems with it, I will, because I think it's about how each element works together and not necessarily what they sound like unto themselves in solo. So it's, it's all about the entire mix, all faders up. Um, and then in terms of what gear I go to, you know, I have my favorites, but, but every, kind of, um, every kind of music requires different gear. Uh, Daniel's asking specifically about rock and alternative. So if that's the case, I would want gear that has character and power and attitude. Uh, so I would certainly use API EQs, Neve modules for low end. I would use uh, universal audio compressors for uh, thickness and power. Uh, I might use my Chandler compressors for effects. Uh, I love my Chandler curve bender. I use that on the stereo bus, especially for rock music, because just a little tiny bit of it really adds a lot of aggression and energy to the sound. Uh, lately, I'm hooked on the uh, Clarifonic EQ. Um, that seems to be a beautiful EQ to use for the overall stereo bus. Even just a crack of it somehow helps guitar rock. It helps the guitars and bass and organ or whatever's in there just come forward and outside the speakers. So maybe the Clarifonic is, is my, my new um, a piece of gear for, for uh, 2013. That might be my one of my favorites. Uh, I love my Shadow Hills compressor. Um, uh, the Listen Grove compressor is great. There's lots of good gear that's out there that I really truly love. Um, but in terms of mixing rock music, those are some of the go-to things. There's a question here from Ray Ketchum. I think I know you, Ray. It's a funny question you asked, basically about uh, what have I discovered new uh, in 2013? Well, certainly a lot of new music, but uh, yeah, I'm sure your question's about gear, because everybody's question is usually about gear. Okay, so some of my favorite pieces of this year, 
uh, have been the Shadow Hills Mastering Compressor, the Shadow Hills uh, UA Mastering Compressor plugin. Uh, a lot of the UA plugins are, are fantastic. I use my satellite everywhere I go. That's a fantastic box. Um, I like the new Listen Grove compressor. It's a sort of emulation of the old Altec 436s. Those are fantastic. Uh, I use my Chandler stomp boxes all the time. Uh, they're, they're guitar distortion pedals that just have a beautiful and unique tone. Um, my Clarifonic Stereo EQ has become my go-to bus EQ. It just does something that no other equalizer does. Um, oh boy, in terms of microphones, there's a lot of great things out there. I, I was just able to hear the new Audio-Technica rectangular diaphragm mic, and I'm sorry with the numbers, I've forgotten the number. But the new Audio-Technica uh, mic is very, very unique sounding, very open and clear and natural and has a way of um, almost removing the glass from the wall. The other thing I'm hooked on these days are the new mic pre EQs from Undertone Audio. They sound unlike anything that you could ever hear. They're a combination of a thick retro sound but a very fast modern sound. Uh, they're very sophisticated in terms of the equalizer and the mic pre has a tone that uh, Everything sounds outside the speakers. Everything sounds more present than all your other instruments there. It's, it's quite a unique box that uh, Eric Valentine's built. Peter is asking a question about how far do I take my mixes? How close do I get them to the finished product? Uh, what do I do in terms of compression, EQ? How much do I leave for the mastering engineer? Uh, he says he's been disappointed in the past when he lets the mastering engineer do all the work. Peter, I trust my mastering engineers. I, I'm fortunate and I've worked with Bob Ludwig and Ted Jensen and Greg Calby and Emily Lazar and Gavin Lurson and some of the great ones and they consistently always do good work. So I never process my last step of the mix too far. I trust them. I let them do their job. I will do some stereo bus compression and EQ, but I always do very, very minimum because I want to preserve the dynamics, but I want aggression and I want glue that a, a final compression uh, will give you. I don't finalize them, normalize them, anything eyes them. I leave that to the mastering engineer. Um, so if I'm doing stereo bus compression with a Allen Smart C2 or a Chandler or a Shadow Hills, I'm only doing a couple of dB at the very, very most. And in terms of bus EQ, if I'm doing any, it's 1 dB on the bottom, 1 dB on the top, and that's about it. I'm very, very gentle with it. And I always feel that a good mastering engineer is going to objectively hear your mix and be able to finalize it. That's what he's there for. So I would say to trust your mastering engineers and hopefully you have to, you know, one thing I do, sorry, Peter, one thing I do is I've studied mastering engineers and I listen to their records and their sounds, if you will. And I try to choose a mastering engineer based on things he's done in the past. In other words, if I'm mixing a very heavy guitar-oriented rock band, one thing I'll do is listen to other records in that genre. And I'll happen to see, oh, look at this. Greg Calby or Ted Jensen mastered all these records, and I like the sound of all these records. They have something in common. And then I'll perhaps choose that mastering engineer for that kind of music. Perhaps if I'm doing something very warm and organic and tasty and simple and I want air and openness or a jazz record perhaps, I might see that, oh, Bob Ludwig did all my favorite records in that genre, so I'll choose Bob Ludwig. And there's many, many other younger mastering engineers that are coming up and doing great work. 
So there's plenty of people to choose from, and, and sorry you had a bad time in the past, Peter.